Brian Nichols has uh, been with the Noble Foundation for about six years now, a livestock consultant in the ag division of Noble. Uh, he's also a cattle producer, also a new dad. So uh, let's welcome Brian Nichols here to the stadium. First off, as is, 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 uh, Ron mentioned, I'm a new dad, trying to kind of tell you who I am and what my, how my perspective comes about. This is my wife and newborn girl, Ryan. I've been here at the foundation six years, a consultant for three. The other part of me that I'll speak about is the producer end. And, and me being a producer is out here in, in Washita County, Oklahoma. Ardmore is down here. We're about three and a half hours northwest, pretty wide open pastures. We've got a couple thousand acres of grass and about 1,500 acres of farmland. We're in crops, we're in cow-calf, we're in stalker cattle. We essentially manage our land to try to make as much profit as we can. If I'm going to talk about 35 years in the future, I think it's, it's necessary to say it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Yogi Berra said this. A lot of things are attributed to Yogi Berra, none of them probably true. But I just wanted to start by looking back at what advances have we made since 1970, and I don't want to talk about the beef industry, but if we just look at how far we've come since 1970, one of the first is the pocket calculator was invented, 1970. 1978, we had an email. 1984, the first, first cell phone. The internet came in 1991 iTunes in 2001, Facebook in 2004, and then the iPhones in 2007. And I think what's interesting to note, and I'll say it again on the next slide, is that just because these things were invented at that time frame doesn't mean they really came to fruition in that time frame. I was asking Clay Wright and asked him when the Noble Foundation got email, and he said it was about 1995. So it took almost 20 years for that invention to really come out and for people to use it widely. Email took almost 20 years for it to really become mainstream. The iPhone came on in 2007, and how long did it take for it to become mainstream? Very short amount of time, right? I mean, does anybody in here, there's probably 97% of the people in here that have a computer in their back pocket, right? Hard to even imagine. 35 years ago. One that I think is, to, to me, has been very, very life-changing, I think, in a lot of ways, is the global positioning system, GPS. If we look back at 1978, that's when they launched the first satellite. I believe the U.S. has at least 24 satellites that work off this system now. It took until 1995 for it to be full GPS availability. In 2000, they finally allowed civilians to have a non-degraded signal to this. I mean, this was all military leading up into that point. And then in 2004, we got it to where we all have it in our cell phones, where we, can, where we have locations where we're at, where we want to go on our cell phones. In the farming industry, if you talk to a farmer that farms very much acreage and all, there's nobody that does not use GPS and automated steering and all those things in their tractors. I mean, it's it just... It's one of those things that it's normal now. And 35 years ago, could you imagine that you could hop on a tractor and hit a button and it does all the driving for you? And it, doesn't, and it misses the exact same amount of space every single time, keeps you on a straight line, it saves you input costs, it saves you labor costs, it saves you a whole lot of sore necks. <laughs> And so it, it's just amazing to me how this, is, how this has come about, and I think it's a great example of technology today. So adoption, if we look back over the years, and this speaks to how technology is adopted and how this has changed over time, electricity came about in 1873. And what this is saying is the years until it was used by one quarter of the American population. Electricity in 1873 took 46 years before 25% of the American population used it. And as we move further along in time, it takes less and less time for these technologies to be adopted. So it's almost crazy at this point in time for us to say what's going to happen 35 years out. Who knows what's going to happen five years out and what, what advances are going to be made and how fast they're going to be adopted. Because we move all the way down here to the internet, the last one in 1991, took seven years before a quarter of the American population used it. 
pretty amazing how fast we're moving in technology. Another way to, to show this, and this is what is thought of a lot of times as the speed of technology, and this is the number of transistors on the largest microprocessors and how that's grown. So essentially what your computers are capable of. And that number doubles every two years from 1971 up until now. Exponential growth. We can do all these things and we do them at incredible speed. So if we're going to talk about technology, I think one thing that's pretty important to talk about is the, is the curve, the technology adoption curve. And I think everybody should kind of know where they fit into this curve. You know, how, how quickly will I adopt technology? Know, your, know yourself. And we talk about this a lot in marketing and your aversion to risk is you need to know what your aversion to risk is because a person can't help you without knowing where you feel comfortable. And so if we look at the curve, the first two and a half percent are the innovators. They're the risk takers. They'll do whatever, whenever, because it's fun and they got money to do it and they just want to see how it works out. Very few are going to be this way and I probably wouldn't encourage anybody to be this way because it can cost a lot of money, especially if you're a producer. Next you have the early adopters. These are the people that you go talk to. You hear about a new technology, you want to learn more about it. Everybody knows that one guy that he is always on the cutting edge, right? And I'm gonna go ask him what he thinks about this because I bet he's tried it. Next is the early majority. I would say I probably fall here in the early majority to the early adopter, somewhere in here. Take their time before adopting a new idea. I, I kind of read about it. I wanna be pretty sure in what it's gonna do, but I don't mind taking a risk every now and then as long as it doesn't cost too much. They'll embrace technology as long as they understand how it fits with their lives. The late majority, peer pressure. Finally, you see everybody else doing it. We've got over half the people in the room doing it. Now you start to feel, yeah, I, maybe, I, maybe there is something to this. Not this many people would be doing it if there wasn't. So they do it out of emerging norms, economic necessity. And then the last, you got the laggards. People never change, never will just kind of part of life, they'll, they'll rock along. And a lot of times they may not have the money to make these changes, but a lot of times it's just we don't like change. We don't like change. So now we'll kind of move on to where do I see the beef industry headed? Where is it going? And, and I, I really approach this from, there's a few things that just stick out in my mind where technology plays a part in this and making us better. And, in some issues that I think the industry has. And so cattle health, pasture nutrition management, data, and then consumers. What do consumers look like in 35 years? And some of this will be in 35 years. Some of it's readily available right now. But I kind of viewed it as what do I see being mainstream? <clears throat> The first thing I want to talk about is cattle health, and, I, and there's, this graph is, is data from cactus feeders, and it was reported at the Bovine Respiratory Disease Symposium in 2014, and this is looking at death loss over time. And if we look at cattle death loss, with all the new vaccines we have and new antibiotics and all these things that have come out, look what death loss has done. Continues to go up. We are in 2001, about 1.6%, 2013, about two and a quarter. We have not been able to actually reduce death loss. It has increased over time. So how do we turn that around? What do we have to do to turn that around? But interestingly, we look at productivity. That same cactus feeders data set, they show that we have increased carcass weights by 4.9 pounds per year from 2001 to 2013. I mean, people aren't stupid. I mean, we can, we can make trade-offs, right? Maybe a few more cattle die, but we made the ones that live, they produced even more, and so our productivity has gone up regardless, right? But Mike Engler from Cactus made a very good statement, I thought. And what he said was, our industry is tasked with balancing both the economic benefits of productivity and the ethical considerations of animal husbandry, and therefore should strive to make improvements in both health and productivity. 
it's not all about production. It's not all about making money. Most of the times it is, but we have a consumer out there and we have a public. And, and I think anybody in this room that raises cattle, you don't like to see cattle die. I hate seeing cattle die. I'll do anything I can to keep one alive. And so we have to balance those two and we have to make improvements in this area, I believe. And so one way we look at that is, is treating cattle. How, how well do we treat cattle? Do they get better? You know, that's one of the first things we focus on is the sick cattle. If you look at lots and lots of studies on treating cattle and how they respond, a main number you'll come up with is that the number needed to treat is two. And what that means is if I have four cattle that I pick out and I'm going to doctor them, two of them are actually going to get better. From the intervention that I impose, they are going to have a positive outcome from that treatment. One of those four was going to get better no matter what. If I'd have never done anything to him, he was going to heal up. Everybody knows those cattle. And then there's one that's not going to get better no matter what we do. Okay? So to me, it's great that we, that we can make a difference in some of these, but then there's, what about those two? The one that's never going to get better no matter what we do, this, this intervention we put on him. How do I know who that is? So I can either come up with another intervention or I can not waste money on treating the calf. And then obviously I don't want to treat a calf that's going to get better no matter what I do, right? We don't want to spend money on that. And we also don't want to contribute to any antimicrobial resistance issues we have. So what can we do about those two cattle? And so it's how do we improve diagnostics? Can we improve diagnosis of these sick cattle and how we handle them? And everybody knows the way that we treat sick cattle now. We pull cattle as we go out. We say, it's just something about that calf. <laughs> Can't really point to it, but I don't like him. Run him up, give him a shot. How do we become more objective at it? This is one potential thing that's being looked at right now. It's a company called Precision Animal Solutions. They use telemetry to look at behavior in cattle while they're in the pen 24 hours a day, and then we can we can do a better job of identifying sick cattle if we know behavior all throughout the day versus the average pen rider in a feed yard sees a calf about every calf about four seconds. So in the, in the period of four seconds, he's determining is he okay or does he need to be doctored, right? This gives us 24 hours a day. <clears throat> and what they've also found is that what we see in behavior is that we tend to look and see the cattle that are off by themselves, right? Those are the ones that are probably sick. But with more data, we see that their actual first behavioral response is to, be, to stay closer to a herd. They don't want to get singled out, right? And so they tend to hang out with cattle more in the beginning of when they're sick. And when you actually see them by themselves, that's a lot more progressed disease. What about other, other indicators? Water intake, weight, feed intake. What are all these other things that we can look at one of the first things we look at is if they, don't, if they go off feed a little bit, if they don't come to the bunk, they may be sick. Is there some automation there that we can do that help us diagnose sick cattle better? What about diagnostics at the chute? If you ever go to the doctor, what's one of the first things he does to you? He puts a stethoscope on you and he listens to your heart, right? There's, there's very few people in the cattle industry that do that, very few that are trained to do that. So this, this is a new tool that's come out that actually works through a computer, and all you do is you stick it up, you, it listens to the lungs, it runs it through algorithms in the computer, and it gives you back a score as to what the lung score of those cattle are. And so now we can more objectively diagnose what's going on in that calf. What do we do about moving forward other than diagnostics? What about prevention? How do we improve death loss other than focusing on the disease? And folks, I think we've had this answer for 50 years, a big part of it, and it's called preconditioning cattle. It's called lowering stress on cattle. But we've seemed to have had a very slow movement towards this. People don't necessarily see the value in it. But I think, I think as we move forward, you know, I believe it's growing. And I believe it will continue to grow, and this will become more the norm, definitely, than it is now. 
Dr. Miles, Del Miles, he said instead of focusing on the 10 to 50 percent morbid cattle, should we focus on the 50 to 90 percent that are not morbid and determine why they stay healthy in the same conditions? Why do we always focus on the sick ones? Let's figure out why the healthy ones stay healthy, right? And so there's a pretty big effort now going into looking at the genetics of BRD susceptibility. Can we select the cattle that are going to stay, stay healthier, that are, that are not as susceptible to disease as others? And they found that there's a, the, the heritability of this is 0.07 to 0.22. So that kind of puts it in the, in the realm of fertility traits. So we can, make, we can make progress as long as there's enough variability within the population, which they think there is. And so I see in 35 years, probably way less than that, that when you select EPDs, you look at EPDs, you're making bull selection, you're looking just as much at how, how healthy are this sire's calves going to stay, just as much as you look at growth traits. What about pasture and nutrition management? This is one thing that probably most folks in here, I mean, as I look across the room, a lot of the people that I work with, I mean, we're, we're forage-based beef cattle producers, right? So, so a lot of our biggest decisions are how we manage pastures and how we manage the nutrition that these cattle are getting. And so what's that going to look like? One of the neatest things that I think I've seen, and, and it hadn't come to fruition yet, but I really think it will, is called geofencing. Okay, and, and this is used in a lot of industries already, is that they put kind of a, a it's a geofence, they lay out the GPS coordinates, and if one of their trucks goes outside of the coordinates that it's supposed to, it's alerting somebody and saying, something right here, okay? And so we could do this with cattle if they, had, if they had these tags and we know what pasture they're supposed to be in and we can deter theft because anytime, the, as soon as that calf steps outside that fence, it alerts me and says, calf isn't where it's supposed to be. But one of the bigger things with it is that we're constantly trying to get ideal grazing distribution, right? And that's a moving target depending on how many cattle we have, depending on the forage conditions, but we're always trying to get the most efficient use of the grasses that we have. And so building fence all the time is costly. If you want a good fence, you want a good six wire fence, that's gonna be what? Five, six thousand a mile at the cheapest in flat country where we're at. So good fence is expensive. Cheap fence is costly too because it costs a lot of time and effort. I kind of, I, I really don't like electric fence whatsoever because it takes a lot of my time. I don't build it near as well as Bill Payne probably does, which, which alleviates a lot of his problems, but it's, a, but it's a costly endeavor. And so what if we have these fences that <clears throat> we set up with GPS coordinates, the animal has some kind of collar or tag on it, and then what, what we're showing here is that when this calf gets into this little blue space, then he starts to hear a little bit of a beep. And then as he gets a little bit closer, he hears a little bit more beep, kind of intensifies, and a little closer and a little closer, and when he finally hits the line, wham, it hits him. Wow, now all of a sudden his behavior starts to modify because he knows that these beeps are come, about to come with a little bit of a shock, and so he hears the beep, he kind of turns around, goes back over here, right? And so we could change the pasture sizes all by doing just GPS coordinates and, and, and demarcating a boundary. And then as we want cattle to come to the pens, it's about time to start working, we just start moving that a little bit closer and a little bit closer. And so instead of having to drive these cattle three miles, maybe over a period of four or five days, we just ease them closer to the pens, walk out there and lot them the next day. I think this is, I think this will come for sure one day. I don't know when, but I think it'll come. The other thing is use of UAVs. This is all the rage in the cropping world, right? Everybody's talking about using UAVs. All these things are is a platform that we can stick any sensor we want to on them. And we can gather any information we want to as long as they're heavy enough and sturdy enough to do it. And so what do we, how do we go about managing our forage right now? We look out there and we say most of the time, oh my, my eye tells me there's about 2,000 pounds out there, right? 
And so these cattle will stay here about this many days and things like that. Or some of us might use a grazing stick. Some of us might clip it. But what if we had a UAV that, that flew a determined path every week? And it automatically reported back to me what all of my forage mass estimates were. Because there is technology like LIDAR that looks at, looks at different canopies. And it could give me back what, what the forage mass is going to be. Maybe it also has a sensor on there that says this is what your forage quality is. It's looking at greenness. It's looking at different things. And it says here's an estimate of the protein and energy of that forage, right? Instead of me going out and, and actually having to hand pick what's out there and then send it into a lab and test it. And then we get it back and then we, then we make a decision. All this stuff is going to become more and more automated. All this, thing ha all this stuff happens without us ever doing anything. We do the initial setup, it runs its course. The, the biggest thing that in, in animal management is weight, right? Almost every single decision that we make is based off of how much does that animal weigh. The only way that we capture those weights now is that we run them across a scale. We either run them up to the, when the, in the pens and whenever we wean or something, we've got, we've got scales underneath our chute, or we run them across a set of pen scales, or maybe we decide we go lot them, we want to know what the weight is, we got to drive them to town, but everything involves a scale and us running them across it. At some point in the future, this is going to be completely automated. And we already have systems now, it's just it's going to take time for them to become more mainstream and work out some of the bugs, and especially with larger cattle numbers, is to how do we capture those weights. This is a system that's at the foundation that one of the, the um, forage agronomists has, and these cattle are out in the pasture, and whenever they want to come get a drink, they have to walk across this scale, reads an ear tag, captures a weight, they get a drink, they go back out, it captures the weight when they're going out. We have grow safe systems that are set up to where every time the cattle come get a drink, they have to step up onto a platform and, uh, and it takes a weight. So this is going to become more and more automated. And I think, I think capturing weights will just be something that happens. It doesn't take any effort on our own, but it will be something that comes. And then individual animal selection on pasture. How much pasture does a cow eat? We know on average what that might be, but we also know that there's incredible variation from one animal to the next. And we want the one that's gonna eat the least amount of pasture and wean the biggest calf, right? And so they're, they're, they're working into, into, into breeding herds now, EPDs and selection based on how efficient an animal is, okay? But I, in 35 years, I, I think this is going to be something that we have on every single animal. If we, have, if we have what they weigh, if we have how much water they drink, maybe we have what body temperature is, maybe we have room and pH from some sensor. There's all these kinds of variables that I think one day we'll put together and we can accurately predict what individual animal intake is. And so you can look at, you can look at your herd and you can say, this cow's the least efficient cow I have, and she's, she's gone. And we continually increase the efficiency of our cow herds. Production data. So how do you handle your data? And this is one thing I, I question myself a lot on, is how do I capture data, and then how do I analyze it, and how do I use it? And a lot of times, I don't capture it, <laughs> I don't analyze it, and I don't use it, right? So think about something as simple as grazing records. How often have I rotated my cows? How many days have they been on a pasture? And, and some of us probably in this room keep really good grazing records. If you're like me, you think about, so when did those cows go in there? Well, it was the, I know it was the day after my wife's birthday because she was mad and I forgot, and so that had to have been February 13th. February. So they, it was February 13th that those cattle came out of there, right? And then what do you do? You may write it down, you may not. And you may write it down and then you never use the number again, right? 
And so I think as we go forward, all these systems start to tie in together. What if all these gadgets talk to each other? What if I've got ear tags in all my cattle and I know what pasture they're in? I know how much they ate, right? I see a day that I, I pull, into a, pull into a pasture in my feed truck and I know automatically how many cattle are in that pasture. I know what their weight is. I know already my, my UAV has flown its path for that week, so I know what forage quantity and forage quality is. It's already told me what kind of feed stuff I need to purchase because it's what's going to match that forage and get my production the way it needs to be. And then automatically my pickup, I just hit a button and I, and I go along and it puts out the exact amount of feed that needs to be put out. It's all automated. These are all decisions that good managers do right now, but there's about six steps in there. And we have to collect the data, we have to do the math, and then we have to apply it. I think the collection of the data and the analysis comes, becomes automatic in the future. I don't think we have to really step in and do any of that. The other part is data to assist marketing. So if, if we look at right now, if you look at the National Feeder Cattle Summary from last week, about 70% of the cattle in the U.S. were sold through auction barns. That's a massive number, right? And there's a whole lot of those that went through the barn and they had absolutely no information that accompanied them. And they're just cattle. And how do we look at those cattle and assign value to them? Well, weight for one. We have muscle scores, we have frame scores, and we have hide color. And to me, all that seems pretty dang subjective other than weight and hide color. And even the hide color, does anybody, does anybody see good black cattle? Yeah. Does anybody see bad black cattle? <laughs> yeah. So how do we become more, more objective in how we describe cattle quality? Is one of these days, I think we'll run cattle through a sale barn and they're going to have very objective numbers assigned to them. And this probably comes through genetic testing. So there, and we already have some of these things out there where you can run genetic tests on an animal and it'll give you a 1 to 10 score on all these different traits. Okay? And so I think this becomes very mainstream in that people are actually going to start valuing cattle on a lot more traits other than muscle score, frame score, hide color, and weight. The other thing I think we're going to see is that we'll have more and more horizontal and vertical alliances. So it's a little easier for feed yards down to get data from the cattle that they purchase. That's a little more easier. That's a little easier. But if you sell cattle and they're at the feed yard and then they go to the packer, it can be very, very difficult to get that, that data back down. And so I, and I think this is, this is one thing I thought about quite a bit and I didn't come up with a good answer. But, but I think that probably the best way that this is going to happen is more alliances, people putting in together into more numbers, you have more bargaining ability and you have, you have reason for those people up the chain to gather that data and, and pass it back down to you. And so lastly is what, what do consumers want? And we hear a lot of, you know, consumers want to know where their product comes from. They want to know a lot more about this product, right? And I think there's a lot of truth to that. But I also think there's a whole lot more truth to consumers pay attention to price. You know, there's, there's a lot of people that, that holler really, really loudly about all these things that they want, but, but that's not a very large number in the big scheme of things. And so I think we do need to produce product for those niches, but I think ultimately, going forward, people will always care, number one, about what does the product cost. And they want the cheapest product that gives them adequate value, right? And so I think that's what we have to focus on. And so why do, why do we want to think 35 years ahead? I went home to help Dad last weekend, and he said, you're giving a talk, right? And I said, yeah. He said, what are you talking about? Well, what the beef industry is going to be in 2050. And he said, why in the world would anybody care what it's going to be like in 35 years? <laughs> he said, i got to make decisions today. I need people to help with how's cash flow is going to be here and three years into the future. And I said, I, I don't disagree with that. 35 years is really pushing it, right? 
But the point is, is that if we don't think ahead, we're going to get left behind, right? And so if we look at cow-calf producers, you know, I think we do this unknowingly a lot of times. You know, I've got to buy some bulls this spring, and those bulls that I purchased this spring, it's going to be two years in our system before I see any income off of them. And, and I'm hoping that that bull sticks around for four years, right? And so he's going to influence at least for six years the kind of calf crop that I'm getting. And then if I keep replacement heifers, his influence might be in the herd for 12 years, right? And so we, we have to think ahead because things we do today influence what happens in the future, okay? The other thing is I think we got to learn from the buggy whip industry. Everybody's probably heard the analogy of you don't want to be the contemporary buggy whip. And this is used for all the industries that have failed to enter into the digital age. They don't change, right? And we don't want to be those guys because in, at, the turn, at, the, at the turn of the century when cars started coming out, there were 40 buggy whip manufacturers in Westfield, Massachusetts. It was known as Whip City. How many do you think there are today? There's one. There's one buggy whip manufacturer left in that city. Okay. Now, how did they stick around? They stuck around, I bet, I don't know this for sure, but I bet they had the lowest cost of production of any of those people that were in the city, right? And I would bet that they accomplished that lowest cost of production by having the latest technology. And they made themselves better. Now, I would also bet that not the, all 39 of the others went out of business, but they got back to what their skill sets were, which is probably craftsmanship, leatherworking, and they found out another way to add value to what they do and sell that product. So I think my point is, yeah, thinking 35 years ahead is a long way out, but we got to think ahead. And we got to adopt technologies as they come online because they're, it, when they help us, not all of them are, some of them are really shiny but don't do anything for us, but we got to adopt the ones that help us increase our efficiency, lower our cost of production, and keep us in business. So with that, I'll quit. Thank you.